Feelings are at the core, at the heart of the mind. I'm going to discuss a lot about feelings this evening, including some potentially challenging ideas. So that's a real opportunity for you to look inward, to compare and consider your own feelings. And uh, we'll return to that issue in the middle of the talk. So why are feelings important? Firstly, feelings are at the heart of motivation. They are the reason that you got out of bed this morning and why the patient with clinical depression struggles to get out of bed. They are the focus of all the decisions that you make, so, so that it's as if we are each sailing a ship, trying to navigate away from feelings of sadness and fear, trying to approach enthusiasm and pleasure. For these reasons, feelings are at the heart of mental illness. This is a quote from my good friend and colleague Mark Solms. Feelings, he says, something that our patients suffer from. Powerful feelings, feelings they sometimes find overwhelming, feelings they would love to escape from, except that you can't escape from your feelings, except perhaps temporarily through sleep or recreational drugs. I can surely only recommend one of those two. Importantly for this evening, feelings are also at the heart of morality because of the important issue of our actions and their impact on the feelings of others. So this is my smartphone. You own one too. It's very clever, much better than me at maths. It's got a better memory, but it's not sentient. It has no emotions. And therefore, I have to confess that I treat my smartphone very badly. I ignore it for hours. And when I'm going to go somewhere, I don't ask its opinion about whether it wants to come along or not, because clever, but no feelings. For these reasons, feelings have been at the heart of much of modern neuroscience and indeed modern psychology, but it hasn't always been this way. In the middle of the last century, an important component of psychology, the behaviorist movement, had a particular attitude towards feelings. That they were not important, and indeed, that the mind might not exist. Here's a quote, an infamous quote, from B.F. Skinner. The emotions, he said, are excellent examples of the fictional causes to which we commonly attribute behavior. Fictional causes. If that's true, then we're all robots or zombies, we're all automata. If that's true, you don't do things because you enjoy them. And your friend who has clinical depression, well their depression isn't real. And so we have to consider whether we would like to live in that sort of world, a world in which you'd be entitled to treat your friends just as badly as I treat my smartphone. What does modern neuroscience then have to say about the biological basis of feelings? I have two important principles that I'd like to get across this evening. And once you know them, you'll be able to understand some of my attitudes towards animal minds and the treatment of disorders of mental health. So here's my first principle, which is that feelings are evolutionarily old. They belong anatomically to a range of structures starting in the upper brainstem, <coughs> distributed through the hypothalamus to some brain areas you've probably heard of, like the amygdala and the anterior cingulate. The important point is not the complex terminology, <coughs> but the fact that these brain areas are shared in common across all mammal species. Indeed, some components are common in other vertebrate species, like birds. We also know something of the number of these basic emotions. This is my good friend and colleague, Jörg Pankser, who dedicated his life to the study of animal feelings and their biological basis and helped to identify how many basic emotions there were. In fact, he literally wrote the book, Affective Neuroscience, the first book on the topic in the 1990s. We know something of the number of these basic emotions, setting perhaps the upper threshold, the high bid at seven, and the low bid at four. You might inaccurately call them happiness, sadness, anger, and fear, but the words of the English language, or indeed of any other language, don't capture the complexity of feelings. I'll try to show you some ways in which we can um, fill out the details with two examples later in the talk. So what can we say then about emotions, their biological basis, and animals? To do that, I'll focus on one particular category of emotion. You probably know it as sadness, although the technical literature refers to it as separation distress, because it's about separating the dyad of people who care about each other. The prototype is the relationship between the caregiver and the developing infant. Separation distress is of course also then the feeling that's at the heart of the attachment relationship, binding people who care about each other together. 
And it is, of course, the system which, when it goes awry, is at the heart of clinical depression. So what can we say then about feelings in animals? I think there are four issues that we might want to discuss, and amazingly, we know the answer to three of them. The first of them is common anatomy. This is a picture from a Jörg Hexer paper, which describes the biological basis of feelings <coughs> in two separate mammal species, human beings above and the guinea pig below. Jörg has helpfully color-coded them so that you can see where the nuclei are across the two species, and they move, of course, from the upper brain stem in blue forwards to the anterior cingulate in green in both species. Common anatomy across all mammal species. Of course, you say to me, we're not guinea pigs, and the answer is right there in the top picture. We have all this extra cleverness, all those extra enfolded layers of the cerebral cortex and their connections, which make us much cleverer, but the core of feelings appears to be the same. The second argument is common chemistry. We know the neurotransmitter systems which underpin feelings, particularly of separation, distress, sadness. And there are things you've heard of, serotonin, oxytocin, prolactin, and the opiates. This is a picture of Candace Pert, who identified with Sol Snyder in the 1970s, the biological basis of these endogenous, inwardly facing opiate systems, the one you probably call endorphins. Common anatomy, common chemistry. They're also, of course, the neurotransmitter systems that we use to try to treat clinical depression. The third element would be to know which behaviours in the world elicit feelings of separation distress, feelings of sadness. And they are, of course, parting of people who care about each other, prototypically the parent and the child. We know what elicits it, and it produces protests, sounds of separation distress, and activities that look to the world uh, like tremendous sadness. We also know something of the activities which stop those feelings. <coughs> And they are the reunification of the part and pair bond, often associated with what a technical literature calls contact comfort. And we here in Wales call the kutch. Spelled with a W in case you want to Google it. Common anatomy, common chemistry, common behavior. That leaves only a fourth item, which is that we might want to ask the question, what does it feel like to be parted from someone that you love? That's a question we can ask of adult humans. But of course we can't ask of non-human animals. Mind you, it's a question we can't ask of small children either, and that doesn't stop us from behaving morally in relation to them. So, as you can see, I have a particular attitude towards animal minds. When I was writing my review paper on this topic, I thought I had what was a tremendously clever idea, which is that the literature on animal minds had been asking the wrong question. There's so much brilliant research on, top, on, on this topic but almost all animal mind research is animal intelligence research, animal tool use, animal problem solving, animal language. But remember that ultimately the great moral decisions are not based on cleverness, but on feelings. So perhaps all this talk about um, unhappiness <coughs> will make you feel difficult. Uh, I tried to remind you earlier, it made me, uh, in the midst of my thoughts of genius, feel a little disappointed when I realized that my clever thought was actually 200 years old. Here's Jeremy Bentham, the philosopher on the topic of animal minds. The question is not, he says, can they reason or can they talk, but can they suffer? So I wonder which feelings I've elicited in you here. Feelings of sadness, feelings of anger, maybe more complex feelings, like guilt. That may well be true, but I remind you that we need to be optimistic in life or else we ourselves will suffer from disorders of mental health. So I encourage us to focus not on the brain's negative emotion systems, but its premier positive emotion system. This was described by Jörg Hanksa as a seeking system, focusing on its curiosity, its interest, and its role in expectancy. More recently, Mark Sons has characterized its subjective experience as that of enthusiasm. And what a powerful force we have in enthusiasm, building energy, sustaining hope, and pushing back against those negative emotions. So when I'm faced with the animal minds issue, which potentially could be framed negatively, I realize that there is an optimistic side to it. We have in our modern world an increasing awareness of animal rights and indeed of human responsibilities. And I'm particularly heartened that my field, neuropsychology, might make a difference to that research topic in the future. So I'd like to return now to the issue of mental health. I'm an academic here in Bangor University. I'm a neuropsychologist by profession. 
but I've also had the great privilege for the last 20 years of being part of the North Wales Brain Injury Service, where we treat patients with various sorts of brain injury, particularly closed head injury and stroke. Our patients have damage to the newer, cleverer, large outside parts of the brain that I mentioned a little earlier. We know that the core, though, of their brain remains intact. We know that, of course, because they're not in a coma anymore. So what can we say about their feeling states and what does that help to tell us about the biological basis of feelings? Well, we know that we have a second important principle. The first <coughs> was that feelings are evolutionarily old. But the second point is that the management of feelings, well, that's new. That's a process we now describe as emotional <coughs> regulation, holding our feelings in check and variously reining them in. This is my good friend and colleague, Christian Salas who's done such remarkable work on emotion regulation and its biological basis over the last decade or so. We've identified areas including the left and the right frontal lobe and the associated brain areas of the insula as being at the heart of helping us to manage these complex states. So what then does it feel like to be one of our patients who's had an injury to these emotion regulation areas? In some ways their lives are emotionally unchanged, but in other ways dramatically changed. They still have anger, as ever they did, but now they have difficulty restraining their anger. And they still have fear, as ever they did, but now they're often overwhelmed by fear. And they still feel sad, as ever they did, but now they find it difficult to move on from sadness and find themselves wrapped up in rumination. This is a quote, a remarkable quote, from one of Christian's patients, in which he describes his difficulties in avoiding these states. It's okay to feel sad, he says, he realizes this, but this is not just a normal sadness, this is what he calls a sticky sadness that makes him feel sadder than he otherwise should. And then he likens it to pulling his foot out of sticky mud and being <coughs> unable to move on. Which skill does he learn after his brain injury? He struggles to inhibit his emotions. He can't reframe them more positively. He struggles to reappraise them in order to generate optimism. And these skills, reappraisal, reframing, are of course at the heart of the psychotherapies. They can be taught. They can be practiced, they can be implemented. And our patients in the Brain Injury Service have benefited enormously over the last few years with the dedication of exactly those activities. So I'd like to wrap up considering the question of mental health by looking at it through the lens of these two important principles. Firstly, we have the old evolutionary brain systems, those that are in ancient brain areas that we said produce too much feelings <coughs> so that our patients struggle to tolerate them. How can we modify those systems? We've known since the middle of the last century how we might address this problem, and that's by changing neurotransmitters, a little bit less dopamine, a little bit more serotonin. This is at the heart of so-called pharmacotherapy. You might also know it perhaps as organic psychiatry, and it works. We've known across several decades that effective clinical trials have shown <coughs> substantial clinical gain. There are, of course, difficulties. Sometimes the treatment produces incomplete symptom relief and it's variable across patients and there are side effects and some of the gain is a result of placebo. But we do know that this works for many patients and we ignore it at our peril. But let's remember that it's only one way of addressing the, the, the mental health issue. There's also a second way into the problem, the newer emotion regulation systems <laughs> that we talked about a few moments ago. Maintaining control over our feelings, reappraising them, reframing them, in a more positive and optimistic light. Again, it's a literature with, with effective clinical trials, but again with some challenges. Of course, it doesn't work completely for all patients. Of course, for many of our patients, the symptom relief is only partial. But of course, we ignore it at our peril. So, I'll finish with a positive. It's a good emotion regulation strategy, finishing with a positive. Which is to point out that, of course, in life, we face challenges, obstacles, difficulties, hurdles, we have to recognize their reality, but at the same time, we can't let ourselves get worn down with the difficulties that we face. If I can quote a, a television program you may have heard of, we must try not to curb our enthusiasm. We need also to build opportunities for optimism. We need to use the brain's positive emotion systems, the one that Yark called seeking, the one that Mark described earlier as generating feelings of enthusiasm. Not curbing enthusiasm, but encouraging it. So, I encourage us all then to try to fight back against these negative emotions, build a state of optimism, get out into the world and try to make it a better place.
And I encourage you, therefore, please, to cultivate your enthusiasm.